Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals. We begin with the historiographer in America with an Episcopal research affair. An article entitled Irish Immigrant Becomes High Church Tutor. Edmund Berry flees religious intolerance in Ireland to become an educator, church planner, and high church advocate in Manhattan. Our Lady of Czechoslovakia, commonly known as OLC, is today a very successful Roman Catholic church in Jersey City. The parish was founded in the 1900s to serve the increasing number of Polish immigrants who were coming to the area. Other than a brief reference on their website, there's nothing to suggest to the modern visitor that when it was originally built as an Episcopal church and named St. Matthew's. Also unremembered is the Episcopal clergyman who presided over the building of the church and its parish. The need This needs to be rectified not only for local historical reasons, but also for the role within the wider history of the Episcopal and Anglican church religious freedom and Ireland. Edmund Drennan Berry was born in County Cork, Ireland. November 11, 1777. At the age of 19, he entered Trinity College, Dublin, the bastion of the Anglican establishment in Ireland. The Irish Rebellion of 1798 threatened the primacy of the Church of Ireland, but Edmund Berry was one of those Anglicans who urged cooperation between faiths. He saw this as the only means of redressing the religious grievances in that country. At Trinity College, he joined a political society sympathetic to the cause, recalling years later that his family, to his family that he pledged. I shall, I promise that I shall, as far as me lies, promote a free toleration of religious principles among all Christian denominations of every kind. After an investigation by the authorities, he was warned that he would be imminently arrested and decided to flee the country. This he did, arriving in America June 9, 1799. His family were not to remain unscathed, however, and all of Edmund's father's property was to be destroyed by government troops. In 1812, Edmund was able to get his father to join him in America, but he died after only six months and was buried in St. Paul's Chapel's graveyard in Manhattan. After being appointed priest in charge of St. Matthew's in Jersey City, Barry oversaw the construction of a stone church with crenellated towers. The congregation organized in 1808 had been meeting in a local schoolroom. The church was built in 1831 and consecrated in 1835. The congregation was dissolved in 1905 and the building sold to the Roman Catholic Diocese. The church is now home to Our Lady of Zetchikwawa. Edmund Berry became acquainted with the Reverend Dr. Moore, later Bishop of Virginia, after arriving in America. Through his recommendation, he received an appointment to superintend the highly respected classical and mathematical academy in New Jersey. In 1803, he was ordained and chosen as the assistant minister of church du Saints of Esprit in New York City. In the same year, the Episcopal Academy was founded, formed in Manhattan. The financial support of Trinity Church with Edmund Berry as the principal. With the exception of a period from 1816 to 1824, when he was professor of languages at the University of Maryland, Berry would flourish both as a priest and educator in Manhattan and Jersey City until 1852. Edmund Berry's view of the Episcopate 
Although Edmund Berry was undoubtedly a believer in religious freedom, he was clearly a man who held strong theological convictions. Upon entering the Episcopal Church, he quickly became associated with the High Church Party. The leader of this movement in the early 19th century was John Henry Hobart of New York, a person described in an obituary of Barry as someone with whom he had a, quote, warm and cordial friendship, the friendship of kindred and confiding souls, which continued till death terminated it in this world. A predecessor to the later Anglo-Catholic movement, high churchmen shunned the Roman Catholic notion of transubstantiation and elaborate ritualism and strictly observed the liturgy of the Book of Common Prayer. Yet they were adamant that the Episcopal Church bishops derived their authority from the apostolic succession of the early church quote Hobart himself, who hated the Princetonians, we would add, high church principles were primarily that we are saved from the guilt and dominion of sin by the divine merits and grace of a crucified Redeemer, that the merits and grace of this Redeemer are applied to the soul of the believer. In the devout and humble participation of the church, administered by the priesthood who derived their authority by the regular transmission from Christ and the source of all power in it. It's more complicated than that, Ted. High churchman means high pride, and it's really a crummy term. Another high churchman that Barry's obituary says had entire sympathy of views and a strong attachment and full confidence of the general Christian friendship was the Reverend Dr. John Bowden. Bowden was an assistant minister at Trinity Church Wall Street who became professor of moral theology at Columbia College. Bowden was well known in the 19th century for his strong views on the episcopacy stating the singular succession, so universally without one exception, boy, that's wrong, maintained by the primitive church has always appeared to me to be a decisive argument in favor of the superiority of bishops. So noted. We turn to table talk, and uh, in the June edition, picking up with Exodus 18, and we proceed forward. We're still in the June edition, and the July has already arrived, but we push forward. Adam, good evening from Ukraine. Or, oh, Artem, good evening from Ukraine. Good to have you, Artem, when we continue to pray for your country. May God deliver the Ukrainians from the tyranny of Putin. We pick up with Exodus 18. Well, I take that back. We're going to do an article first. And the article is Prone to Wander by Christina Fox. She's a counselor, retreat speaker, and author of several books. She serves her local church and women's ministry in crisis care. Did you ever look at your life and think, if only this happened, then my life would be better? What would you fill in for the blank? Perhaps a different job, a bigger house, success in ministry, a dream realized. Many of these if-onlys are not only inherently bad, but many even are about the good God-given things. The problem for our hearts is that we tend to look at those things to rescue us from the dissatisfactions of our present life. We look to those things to give our lives comfort, meaning, and hope. And in doing so, we make them functional saviors and idols of our hearts. As believers, we are called to love the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. 
we were created for worship. And because we are new creations united to Christ by faith, our hearts belong to him alone. And while we have been delivered from the power of sin, the presence of sin remains in us. And one of those remaining sins is idolatry. Certainly we don't erect statues of wood or stone and bow down to them, but we look for hope in people, circumstances, achievements, and material things. We will place our trust in ourselves or in our money or in things under our control to rescue us from our troubles. We will make if-only lists and pursue their fulfillment. The prophet Jeremiah spoke about Israel's idolatry, for they too placed their hope in lesser things. They turned to Egypt for rescue and deliverance. They placed their trust in Assyria. God declared, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed out cisterns for themselves broken cisterns that can hold no water. Jeremiah 2, verse 13. God says that they turn from the fountain and source of life, the Lord himself, and instead turn to empty, useless counterfeits. They turn from their true deliverer to their false rescuers. We do the same when we place our hope in anything apart from Christ. When we look to material things to comfort us in the stresses of life. When we look to our work to give our life meaning and purpose. When we look to other people, experiences, or fulfillment. In all these ways and more, when we drink from the well of idolatry, we are always left thirsty. For no idol can satisfy the human heart. As the old hymn says, our hearts are prone to wander. We are constantly tempted to place our trust and hope in false saviors. This means we must battle idolatry. We must uproot idols from our hearts and return to our first love, Jesus. For he alone is the source of our help. Whenever we find ourselves thinking, if only... It's a good indication that there is an idol lurking it behind and nearby. Instead, may we respond to all those if-onlys within Christ alone. And now Jethro, we switch to the exposition of the book of Exodus, Exodus 18 and Jethro and Moses. Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel and that he had delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians. Rephidim was the region where the Israelites received water from the rock that Moses struck and where they defeated the Amalekites. It was located near the base of Horeb, another name for Mount Sinai or the Sinai Peninsula. The region of Midian was also there, as we learned in Exodus 2, 11 to 22. Moses' wife, Zipporah, was the daughter of the priest of Midian. Hey, Dr. Bob, yeah, we are. We're praying for Artem and all the Ukrainians. Putin, he just wants a bigger kitchen. In a bigger house. Today's passage describes the reunion of Jethro and Moses. We see that Jethro, having heard of all that God had done for Israel in the Exodus, came out to meet Moses with Zipporah and two of Moses' sons, 18, 1 to 5. We do not know when Zipporah and the two boys had gone to Midian. For Moses never describes leaving his family or sending them back to the land of origin. Most likely he had them go to Midian when he and Aaron reached the border of Egypt as they were entering the land of Nile to make the case to Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. 
In any case, the reunion was a joyful one, and we get a glimpse of that warm meeting that Jethro and Moses exchanged. When Moses met with his father-in-law, he told Jethro, Jethro, about all of the experiences in the Exodus, the difficulties and the deliverance that God had promised. This news caused Jethro to rejoice and to recognize the greatness of Yahweh, the covenant Lord of Israel, over all the other gods. Some commentators refer to this as the point of Jethro's conversion to faith in the one true God of Israel, which is certainly possible given that we are not told explicitly in the earlier chapters of Exodus that Jethro was a priest of Yahweh. It's also possible that Jethro's response to the news of Israel's rescue from Egypt reflects the strengthening of his theological understanding that the God of Israel is greater than all the so-called deities of the ancient Near East. Either way, Jethro came to a new understanding and confidence in Yahweh, as seen in his offering up of a sacrifice to the Lord. John Calvin comments, quote, this was Jethro's first sincere and legitimate sacrifice since the God of Israel had been clearly known to him, close quote. That the news of God's great act of salvation in the Exodus drew forth a response from Jethro makes perfect sense. After all, it is through the active work of the Holy Spirit that is what elicits saving faith. First Peter 1, 22 to 25. We turn now to Jethro's wise advice, Exodus 18, 13 to 23. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear, you will wear yourselves out. For the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. 600,000 Israelite men on foot, plus their wives and children, plus a multitude of people from other nations left Egypt under the direction of Moses. Exodus 12, verse 37 and 38. That made for a total of more than a million people in the company of Israel, and probably upwards of 2 million or so. In a group that large, disputes between people that required adjudication were bound to occur. We learn in today's passage that this was indeed the case of the Israelites as they made their way through the wilderness after the Exodus. Early in Israel's post-slavery history, we see in Exodus 18.13, Moses was the sole judge of the nation's disputes. It was common in ancient Near East for the political and military leader of a people to serve as its judiciary as well. Moreover, in ancient Egypt, the Pharaoh made himself available to adjudicate all legal matters. Any Egyptian, not irrespective of his social status, could present his case to the Pharaoh at least at designated times throughout the year. Moses' practice of hearing all legal matters as well as keeping up with the expectations of the day. No person can handle such a large number of cases. So one might imagine it was wearing Moses out. Jethro, his father-in-law, noticed this and critiqued Moses for the practice. Yet unlike so many people who criticize but have no constructive solution, Jethro had wise counsel for Moses to lighten his load so that he would not be exhausted by the demands of Israel's legal issues and could devote himself to other matters. He told Moses to appoint trustworthy judges who could hear cases and make good decisions. 
leaving them to all but the most, leaving himself only to the most complicated matters. Moses would serve effectively as the Supreme Court in Israel and decide the high cases that other judges could not handle. This became the model for Israel's legal system, with the king serving as the final court of appeal once the monarchy was instituted. See Solomon in 1 Kings 3. The ancient Israelite judicial system no longer exists, but the church can learn from today's passage something about the wise policy. A solo pastor, bishop, or other individual is not equipped to handle all church matters. Administration by several qualified men in dialogue with others is a better system. Very nice article. And we turn our attention to the next table talk. The Salt of the Earth and the Light of the World by Christopher Gordon, who is a Facebook friend and is a pastor. He's a doctor, I believe, yes. Nope, I'm wrong. He's the pastor of Escondido United Reformed Church in Escondido, California, and he has doctor. I'm drawing a blank. The president of Ligonier teaches church history at Westminster Escondido, or he's retired now. Bob Godfrey, Dr. Bob Godfrey, teaches his Sunday school class at this church. Wonderful classical Christian academy for youth as well. This is on the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Think of the struggle we are witnessing in our culture over the question of identity. Today, people are on the endless quest for an identity in those things that they believe will make them happy. Good afternoon, Mary. Good to have you here, too. We got Dr. Bob and Artem from Ukraine. Glad to have you. The culture tells people to turn inward and follow the desires of their hearts to identify their identity. At once, people believe they've found their true identity. Notice how passionate they are to make it known. With all the challenges surrounding identity, we often tell Christians to be careful of these alternative identities proposed by the world and to pursue the identity we have in Jesus Christ. But what is our identity? Have we thrown this phrase around too loosely without helping people understand precisely, without help, what we're talking about? It is not enough simply to tell people that they have a new identity in Jesus. Great attention needs to be given to help people understand what this identity is so it can be valued and exercised. When we understand how Jesus defines our identity, that understanding forms the foundation upon which we build our lives. Jesus defines our identity. As Jesus opens his Sermon on the Mount, he declares that Christians are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. It's easy to pass over this statement without realizing that Jesus defines our identity in this world with the metaphors of salt and light. In the Beatitudes that precede this definition of our identity, Jesus describes what we are by God's grace. Christians are characterized by meek, merciful, pure in heart, and peacemakers, and as those who rejoice when persecuted. The Beatitudes are not imperatives telling us how to achieve this blessedness. Jesus is describing certain qualities that define the character of true believers who are blessed by God. In what follows, Jesus expresses how these qualities are demonstrated before the world. 
and reveals what believers accomplish. Jesus first describes believers as salt in the world. Salt in the ancient world was used to prevent the decay of foods and favor those flavor those foods for a better taste. <clears throat> Com people commonly knew that gypsum and other minerals would dilute the potency of salt and make it useless in the preservation of foods. Jesus used this familiar phenomena with the added concern that if the salt loses its same flavor, it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and walked upon. Matthew 5.13 Believers are like salt in the world. Their distinctive character through good works preserves and flavors the world to prevent its decay as we studied in the how medieval Christians salted and transformed some of the practices of European slavery. Didn't wipe it out, but they mollified it. The second metaphor describes believers as light in this world. I have a common first century lamp that was used in Jewish households to provide light in their homes. The lamp is small and unassuming. One day I put a small amount of oil in the lamp with a wick, turned off the lights, and lit the wick to experience how people in the first century, without the benefit of modern electricity, lit their homes when it was dark. This lamp, though small, enabled me to see throughout the entire room. Jesus expresses how inappropriate it would be to be in a dark place to hide the lamp under a bowl. The intention of light is to provide a way for people to see where they are going. This is precisely what Jesus is after in calling believers the light of the world. They show people the way of salvation. There's no question that Jesus is reacting to the hypocritical religion of the Pharisees who made a public display of their religious devotion to receive the praise of men. But a strange irony is found in insincere public display of commitment to God since it is intended to glorify oneself in its pursuit. The effect of that is hiding the true character of a Christian. He is salt without saltiness, a lamp hidden under a bowl. All religious devotion that is not intended for God's glory does not display a sincere witness to those who observe its superficial display. It has the effect of hiding what is true and genuine from the world. The Pharisees and all their religious show did not lead people to glorify their Father in heaven. Jesus exposed them as hiding true religion under the false pretense of religious devotion. Jesus is concerned to describe what a believer truly is and consequences that result in the world. A look at a true Christian the world in which we live is blighted by sin, and people live in darkness without knowing the true way to God. People are searching as they did at the Tower of Babel to find a way to heaven. But Jesus specifically prayed in the high priestly prayer for his followers not to be taken out of the world. The metaphors of salt and light that Jesus uses in Matthew 5 to define our identity, help us understand why believers are left on the earth. The Lord always intended his people to be the salt and light of this world. In the Old Testament, when God made a covenant with Israel, it was also often referred to as the covenant of salt, Leviticus 2.13. The covenant of grace made with Adam was intended to include all nations of the earth. 
and the reference to the covenants being made in salt reminded Israel that they had a preserving presence among the nations as God was fulfilling his plan to bring salvation. An appointed day is coming when Jesus will bring an end to this present world in final judgment. Until that day, believers persevere in this world from the ultimate decay into sin. There's a peculiar character of Christians in their presence in the world that stays what is passing away. As the author of the well-known hymn, Abide With Me, writes, Change and decay in all around I see. When we live as true Christians, pursuing the good works that glorify our Heavenly Father, we accomplish the preservation of the world. Take Christians out of this world and everything would quickly fall into irreparable ruin. Likewise, Israel was designated as God's light to the nations, a light that offered hope of the Savior that was to come. Isaiah 49, 6 states, I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Along with preserving and flavoring the world, Christians also give this world the only true light. Jesus said of himself that he is the light of the world, one of the great I am statements of John's gospel. As the Lord is our light and our salvation, we are his followers and are the ones whom his light shines in this world to make Jesus known. This is why, this is the reason that Christians are designated as light in the world who are to walk as children of the light, Ephesians 5, verse 8. Christians have a distinctive witness as Christ's light. It is God who commanded that light shine out of darkness, and our purpose is to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. Deep within the Christian heart is a burden that people would know the forgiveness of sins and peace with God that Jesus brings through his life. Yes, Christians influence the world in many different ways, including the political environment, providing help to the poor, and in other ways that demonstrates compassion to the needy. And we'll pick that up in our next edition. As we switch now to the Protestant, I'm sorry, the standard bearer in the article, uh, testimonial, from Bruce, David, and Nita Burse in the Philippines, entitled Missions in the Philippines. How the Lord brought Nida and me together was miraculous. A friend and I visited at Anita, a woman who was a devout Christian and committed house mother of the CCM. She conducted a Bible study for children faithful every Saturday with a fair number of attendees. An adult study, and I just interject here, it's delightful to see Protestant reform missions in the Philippines. But early December came to 2015, and it was time to bid adieu to the Philippines. Good experience, but no way I'd ever go back. I only wanted to go home. Thrilled to return to American soil, I sought pastoral vacancies at once. In South Grafton, Massachusetts, I was one of eight selected to candidate for the opening. It went well, but in the end, I was a runner-up. I was heartbroken. But the Lord's hand again then opened the door for another trip to the Philippines. Nida had written me when I was back. She had, not, had she not emailed, I doubt I ever would have continued communication. I was not wild about returning to the poverty, hardship, traffic, pollution, heat, overpopulation, climate changes, 
bad economy, and certainties which were a part of the package deal. It was easier by far to live in the comfort and ease of the United States. Here again we see we do not control our destinies or desires. Almighty God brought his plan to fruition, not mine. So in summer of 2016, off I went back to Manila. Nida and I were married in the CRBC, the traditional Pinoy wedding. Neither of us had been married before. God led me to a Proverbs 31 woman. I find that true every day. We live a simple life. Prior to the pandemic, we were active missionaries with all those trips to Alaka Sur and 12-hour bus rides. I love teaching Sunday school at GPBC in Tondo, as well as guest preaching everywhere where when invited at three area churches in Montalban, attending classes both in person and online at William Carey School of Theology, and day-to-day -day living here in a crowded subdivision. But the past two years have been health, economic, and other challenges, mainly NIDA's bout with cancer from which God delivered her. Our ministry is stunted and stalled, and this weighs heavily upon us. But we look not at the circumstances, but God's purpose in it all. Now it appears I may be retiring. Nida and I both agree it is the Lord's will. We want not our own. Our desire is to be faithful unto the end. Daily we can see God's guidance and provision. The word sovereignty cannot be overused. Again, we experience this and how the Lord led us to Berean Protestant Reformed Church. It was the first Lord's Day of 2021 when we first saw a service of the PRCA. It was Reverend Smith. We love the exposition, serious approach, orderliness, regulative form of worship, and psalm singing. They are serious here, I thought. No games, no folly. This is what we crave. So we visited Provident as well as Berean and were blessed to hear in subsequent weeks the adept preaching of Reverend Klein as well as Pastor Ibby. Of course, 2021 brought several interruptions to corporate worship. We became very pleased with the Christ-centered nature of the Protestant Reformed Churches of America. This is so hard to find in such days of unbridled apostasy. We had no desire to change our church affiliation when this began, but the sovereign Lord of the universe worked in our hearts. We seek purity and worship, a sober attitude, and to live God-glorifying, holy lives to match. Relinquishing preaching of the word, teaching Sunday school, and bringing the communion devotional to our brethren in Tondal is very painfully difficult. It is what I do and love to do. There is nothing that has given me greater satisfaction than ministry. Our desire as a couple is to utilize our abilities to glorify God. But we must yield to what God desires. His will is not ours. So we are confident after much prayer and contemplation that the right decision at this time of our lives, entering the early twilight years, is to shorten our commute, transfer our membership to Berean from Tondo, be the salt and the light. There's that again. We are called to be, to be assets and not liabilities, to reflect the light of our blessed Jesus in our lives. We w wish to finish our lives, <clears throat> finish our race strong, just like St. Paul. God himself led us to the narrow road on which we find ourselves. We only wish to please the Lord 
and a life that honors him. We are very flawed, and yet the Lord is tender, compassionate, and gentle with all his little ones. So it is that we begin our formal association as prospective members of Berean Protestant Reformed Church. We thank God for his love. May he sanctify us and may, may as he makes us conform to the image of Christ. Soli Deo Gloria, sincerely in Christ, Dave and Nida, verse. A lengthy testimonial reminding us that God works in all of the details of every single life, the elect and the non-elect. Turn to the Bibliotheosacra, Thika Sacra, not abandoned the Sheol and the Psalms and the hope for the righteous after death. And Dr. Kyle Durham is examining the Old Testament texts. We've been working on Psalm 16, 9 through 11. The clauses demonstrate a variety of uses with some uncommon, with some common threads. In Genesis 39, 12 to 13, Joseph flees the failed seduction of Potiphar's wife and leaves his garment in her hand. The verb azav here governs the accusative baga. Bagado, his garment, with the complement phrase, be yada, in her hand. Denoting that the garment is left in its sphere, in her hand, as he flees. In Isaiah 50, verse 8, Jacob's, oh, I'm sorry, Genesis 50, verse 8, Jacob's sons go to Canaan to bury him, leaving their dependents, flocks, and herds in the land of Goshen. In Leviticus 19, verse 10, and 23, verse 22, have an identical clause commanding the Israelites to leave a portion of the vintage for transient sojourners who live in the land. He's commenting on the verb leave. In Psalm 37, 33, the psalmist proclaims that Yahweh will not abandon or allow the godly one to pass into the sphere of the hand of the wicked who set an ambush to destroy him. Here the, here the be, or beta, a prepositional phrase, signifies the sphere to which Yahweh will not give over the godly. In Genesis 49, 11, the deceased universally leave behind their wealth to others when they die. Job 39, 14 pro provides the closest analogy to our text. Here Yahweh caricatures the silly ostrich who abandons her eggs to the ground. The verb governs the accusative, basse, her eggs, with the preposition le, heading a spatial complement to the earth the book of Nehemiah records the post-exilic Levites rehearsing the redemptive Israel, history of Israel. They remind the assembly that Yahweh did not leave Israel behind in the wilderness, Nehemiah 9.19, but gave them over to their enemies due to their persistent evil. In 2 Chronicles 12.5, the prophet Shemaiah confronts Rehoboam over his foolish disregard of the Mosaic Covenant. Yahweh says, because Rohaboam has forsaken him, Yahweh will now abandon him to Shishak, king of Egypt. Here the verb governs the accusative you with the complement biad Shishak in the hand of Shishak, denoting the sphere into which Yahweh would relinquish Rehoboam. In 25, 24, verse 25, the Syrian army leaves behind Joash, the Israelite king, with the compliment, Bamam Halaim, hopefully my cataract surgery will enable me to read Hebrew and Aramaic 
all the dots, jots, and tittles. We'll see. Signifying the condition in which he is left. In tying together all these uses, the key to the present discussion converges on whether the psalmist in Psalm 16, verse 10, means that Yahweh will not leave him behind in Sheol after he's already there, or that Sheol will not allow him to descend into Sheol at all. <clears throat> the majority of scholars opt for the former interpretation, arguing that the psalmist envisions divine protection from an untimely or evil death. The verses above that that feature parallel constructions about evenly divided between these senses, with six supporting the former sense and five the latter sense. Will God abandon one to Sheol? Pick that up next time. Now for modern Reformation. The young fellow by the name of Jordan Stefaniak critiquing Biblicism in an article, Everything in Nature Speaks of God, Understanding Sola Scriptura, a right. He's complained about Biblicism. I refer the reader to Dr. Tr Thomas Cranmer's great preface to the Great Bible, as well as the very serious, down-to-earth, fresh, clear-speaking preface by preface to the Pentateuch by William Tyndale. This is a very American approach here. Let's see where he goes. We're watching him closely. A more nuanced Biblicism. Stand by. He's going to tell us how to read the Bible better. But Biblicism is not restricted to those who argue that Scripture must be the sole source of theology. There is another more nuanced approach to a Biblicist framework. Consider the following revised definition. Temporal Biblicism. Scripture is authoritative for all concepts of God and any other theological locus such as morality and anthropology. Therefore, theological commitments must emerge from Scripture first and be consistent with Scripture. Intuition, creed, confession, tradition, and any other source is incompatible with the supremacy of Scripture if they are understood temporally prior to Scripture. In this definition, rather than scripture needing to be the sole source for theology, it must be the first source for theology. Take Bruce Ware as a representative example. He argues that God is not to be understood first in his metaphysical perfections, for such notions of God are supplied by philosophy and not divine revelation. Honk, honk, honk. Siren sounds, Bruce Ware's on the loose as he gives us his pontification, his edict. Ware argues for a strict binary between scriptural knowledge and every other mode of being, saying that God should not be understood first by concepts from nature before supernature. The key problem noted by Ware is the mediums of knowledge besides scripture hold primacy over scripture because of the distorted epistemic ordering. For Ware, if someone knowingly or unknowingly understands God through nature before scripture, then in their methodology they reject the authority of the Bible. So where does not deny the validity of natural theology? Scripture need not be the sole source of theology. But he argues that natural theology is a required location in the process of knowing. But I'm not sure where that's going or where this article is going. We're not happy with it. We know that. We want plain talk. Good dogmatic order, despite the 
pious sounding concerns about epistemic ordering or good dogmatic order from those like where such versions of biblicism fail to convince for several reasons. First, the Christian tradition largely disagrees. While many seek to follow good dogmatic order, there is no consensus or necess necessity in this order ordering. Good dogmatic order does not require Holy Scripture to exercise epistemic primacy in every respect. While the Christian tradition affirms the Spirit's epistemic work as the ontological principle of knowledge, the Spirit himself, and the infallible external cognitive principle of knowledge, Scripture, it also affirms that the spirit functions as the internal cognitive principle, causing knowledge to be received, contemplated, and confessed via various sources. Such an understanding of the epistemic ordering is decidedly not temporally relevant. The internal cognitive principle can often pedagogically precede the external cognitive principle, and this is not understood as a problem. Scripture remains logically prior, nor does such an understanding suggest that the external and internal principles cannot function independently. Read that to a dying man on his deathbed, please. We now shift, and we're not sure where that guy's going, to Kelvin Theological Journal. And thankfully, the eco-theologian has been dispatched to the paper shredder. We turn to a new article by Gerard Sissar, The Beatitudes in the Life of the Church. Matt, this would be Matthew 5 through 7. Because the Beatitudes introduce a sermon that ends with warnings about the consequences of not putting these words into practice, Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27, they call for much more than a surface engagement. If the warnings apply to the introduction and not just the body of the sermon, one must answer the question, what do the Beatitudes call us to do? The goal of this article is to establish that the Beatitudes are a call to action. Number two, to define the specific actions to which they call us. I will accomplish the first goal, and I would say the Beatitudes describe an estate condition as much as an imperative voice, but let's see. Number two, to define the specific actions to which they call us. I will accomplish the first goal by exploring the context of the Beatitudes and briefly ex examining its genre. To accomplish the latter, which is the core of this article, I aim to explore whether there is a chiastic relationship in the Beatitudes property proper, such that the actions of the last four are designed to meet the needs of the first four. And if such a relationship exists, how it informs our understanding of the Beatitudes. In other words, if two lines are related to each other, then the meaning of each line must be in, understood in the light of that relationship. Such a relationship provides context, which helps us understand how the use, words are being used. More specifically, I'm proposing that there is a chiastic relationship between the first four Beatitudes and the last four in such a way that when the disciples meet people in the conditions of the first four, doing the actions of the last four there in that relationship is the kingdom of heaven manifest. Further, the meaning of each Beatitude is clarified when viewed in this relationship do not propose an exclusive relationship. Disciple can only do the action of the eighth bay attitude toward those in the condition of the first or the seventh to the second and so forth. 
once the meanings are clarified by their chiastic relationship, it becomes clear how each of the last four could minister to those in the condition of any of the first four. Okay, we shift now to Anglican and Episcopal History, that journal. And we are on a book review of the British Zion Congregationalism, Politics and Empire, 1790 to 1850, reviewed by Jason Bruner of Princeton Seminary. Ruse begins in the late 18th century when evangelical dissenters successfully mobilized toward political causes such as the abolition of slavery and the securing of religious and civil liberties. Their political momentum then affected the defeat of the 1811 side, side mouth bill and the 1813 revision of the East India Company Charter which allowed missionaries greater access to the subcontinent. Charged with these victories and bolstered in their civil convictions, Congregationalist missionaries from the London Missionary Society applied their tactics to the socio-political context of the Cape Colony to protect the Khoi from unjust treatment by British settlers and colonial administrators with a benevolent paternalism, LMS missionaries organized petitions, wrote letters, and published books in order to secure the rights of the Khoi, thus putting them at odds with the colony's territorial expansionists. By the mid-19th century, however, differing racial and cultural assumptions amongst the LMS missionaries and conflicts between their stations contributed to the erosion of these gains made on behalf of the indigenous Southern Africans. Roots's overarching narrative, however, is the positive legacy of the early Congregationalist missionaries who, under the influence of common sense assumptions regarding the nature of humanity, to provide a higher degree of protection from land encroachment. Roots's concise work is more con cogent than exhaustive, and as such, leaves some dimensions of the history underexplored. For example, Roots indicates a change in the disposition of the second and third generation missionaries towards indigenous Southern Africans but with little explanation for this transition and demeanor. And we'll pick this up later. And we shift to Westminster Journal, the classical and contemporary engaging Trinitarian and new mathological modeling for ongoing theological construction. Tory Tier discussing social Trinitarianism versus Trinitarianism in the classical creeds. For his part, Zizis Ziolas, a social Trinitarian, whose 1985 work Being as Communion profoundly influenced all subsequent trajectories taken by social Trinitarianism and argued for the retrieval of the Cappadocian Fathers' so-called breakthrough in ontology that personhood and communion, rather than nature and substance, are primary ontological categories. In other words, genuinely personal relationships should be through the lens through which one understands divine metaphysics or ontology. About a decade later, Lacugna served as a sort of nexus of 20th century Trinitarian development. As Grentz details, quote, a more thorough account of trajectory in which she stands might suggest that Lacugna combines impulses from Ziziolus with Bart's focus on the pseudonymity significance of the divine self-disclosure in Christ. Rahner's linking of the Amanit Trinity with the economic trinity 
which she revises and reformulates as Theologia et Oikonomia, in the interest of viewing the divine life through the history of the Trinitarian persons evident in Ponenberg, Moltmann, and Jensen. By way of summary, per Vanderbrink, although not every per representation of this renaissance endorsed social Trinitarianism, the secret behind the renaissance success was often labeled the social model of the Trinity. I have thus laid sufficient contextual con ground for further engagement with social Trinitarianism. I briefly de define the social model, summarizing the primary characteristics shared by various social views and offer an example that includes those features. We'll continue that next time as we shift to Mid-America Theological Journal. Still no peaking Karl Barth's conflict with federal theology, Dr. Beach. And we will be done in a few days. We've already gathered enough about Karl Barth's toxicities. The aforementioned text, he's brought in the final judgment, final estate of the wicked and the righteous, which Bart does not like, but which he cannot escape. The aforementioned texts we cited demonstrate this, and they can be multiplied. Texts that draw a different part, portrait than Bart's picture of grace. For example, Jesus' teaching regarding the wide gate and the road that leads to destruction with the many that are on it. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. That Sodom and Gomorrah were more righteous than the cities that walk in unbelief, despite Christ's performance of miracles in those cities. Matthew 10, verse 15. Matthew 11, 22, 23. The testimony that those who deny Jesus in this world, he will deny before his Father in heaven. Matthew 10, 33. That the sin against the Holy Spirit is an unforgivable sin in this life and in that which is to come. Matthew 12, 32. All these passages seem to point to the opposite of a second chance sort of doctrine issuing forth and a possible widening circle of salvation. Similar texts also come to mind. Consider the parable of the wedding banquet where the guest without wedding clothes is cast out into outer darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 22, 13. Or the parable of the 10 virgins where those who are unprepared are declared unwelcome and unknown, Matthew 25, 12. Or the parable of the rich fool who must give an account upon his dying unexpectedly and no mercy seems to await him. Or the events in Luke 13 where the call goes forth to repent or perish. Or upon the death, the final verdict seems final. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus also point opposite of Bart's hope. Matthew 25, 31 to 46, where the nations are portrayed as being divided as sheep and goats, likewise appears incongruous with the import of Bart's doctrine. In the Gospel of John, condemnation is the verdict on those who have not believed on Jesus' Son. John 3.18. Paul's words to the Athenians suggest that judgment awaits the unrepentant. Acts 17, verses 30-32. The destiny of those who live as enemies of the cross of Christ is, says Paul, destruction. Philippians 3.19. Those who do not know God or obey the gospel of Jesus shall suffer eternal destruction. 2 Thessalonians 1 9. Those abide in sin perish under God's wrath. 1 Corinthians 6 9. 
Ephesians 5, verses 5 and 6. Pivotal texts also include 2 Peter 2, which seriously cautions believers away from the path of false teachers, using the example of fallen angels who are sent to hell, 2 Peter 2, 4 and following. The book of Revelation is filled with judgment scenes, including the final judgment scene of Revelation 20, 11 to 15. Besides the earlier mentioned scene of the book of life. Similarly, the depiction of the new heaven and new earth in the holy city of God is contrasted with all those who are called cowardly and unbelieving, the vile, the murderous, the sexually immoral, the practitioner of magical arts, idolaters, liars. All these were consigned to the second death, that is, the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, Revelation 21, verse 8, Revelation 22, verse 15. Moreover, the wrath of God is depicted as the wrath of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17. It is he who is feared. The nations of the earth will mourn because of him, for they behold the one who judges all flesh, the one who comes on the clouds of glory to judge the living and the dead. Revelation 1, verse 7, Matthew 24, verse 30, Mark 14, verse 62. Bye-bye, Mark. We now shift to the global Anglican and the images of atonement that appear in the Common Worships Order 2 and its significance for the mission of the church. Alexander Evans on the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. This is quite a surprise, surprising to us that they retain the classical aspects of the polychromatic view of atonement. Substitution is at the heart of atonement and undergirds the work of the atonement such as the temple, marketplace, ransom, law court, justice, and reconciliation family. As John Stott comments, how then could God express simultaneously his holiness in judgment and his love in pardon? Only by providing a divine substitute for the sinner so that the substitute would receive judgment and the sinner pardon. This understanding of the atonement goes beyond purely the inevitable consequences of sin, including alienation from God, to include propitiation of God's wrath. Mankind's natural state is to be under the wrath of God, that is, not human-like wrath, but God's strong, personal, and settled hostility to evil. There's clear evidence in the scriptures that Christ is set forth as a substitutionary propitiation for our sins. This is just stunning to me as I read this from an Anglican journal. Delighted to read it, by the way. In particular, Jesus makes strong connections between the Passover sacrifice and the breaking of his body and the shedding of his blood. For example, Mark 14. And Jesus also clearly identified the suffering servant's death with his own death. Luke 22, verse 37. As did his disciples, Acts 8, 32 to 35. Hart points to the Pauline writings and shows that Jesus in his suffering and death bears the divine judgment on the human side, whereby the crucifixion is a bearing of the curse of the law, Galatians 3, verse 13, in which Jesus was made sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, so that the wages of sin, that is death, are finally paid, and the wrath and judgment of God are dealt with, Colossians 3, verse 6, 1 Thessalonians 1.10. 
The church through the ages has acknowledged the centrality of substitution and the understanding of the atonement. To take two of the leading patristic theologians, Athanasius said that formerly the world as guilty was under judgment of the law. But now that the word has taken on himself the judgment and having suffered in the body for all, has bestowed salvation to all. And we would have to say the elect there. But Augustine wrote that Christ, though guiltless, took our punishment, that he might cancel our guilt and do away with our punishment. Exquisitely glorious article by that writer. We turn our attention now to um, the Reformed Presbyterian Journal of 1837. And he's making, what's his argument here? Do I have the right one? I believe we do. He's arguing for the use of the mind in reflection. There exists, therefore, no reasonable objection, objection against the application of the mind to the consideration of the works of God as they are put before us in the fabric of heaven and earth. And to this end, it, it must be lawful to avail ourselves of all the advantages that science affords. If the heathen kingdom of Tyre contributed to the materials and the building of the taber, temple of God under Solomon in Judea. Let it not be accounted unreasonable that religion shall avail herself in public and social interests of the aids of science and make it minister as a handmaid in the temple of truth, rearing in the soul to the glory of Jehovah. It is true indeed that all have not, amid the multifarious avocations of human life, the time to devote to such pursuits, but many more than they give, and many who have both the time and intellectual endowments adapted to these acquirements are hindered from attending to them by remaining unacquainted with their value. Let such especially be earnestly adjured to lay aside their misapprehensions and groundless prejudices and be assured that the cultivations of their minds with the knowledge of God's works is an employment most becoming of rational and immortal beings. In them they will see the radiance of the divine majesty and glory of Jesus Christ, beaming forth more and more conspicuously in the orbs that shine in the firmament of heaven and will find all true science, while kept under the discipline of true religion and theology, most subservient to their moral improvement here and in the knowledge of God. In a future number, it will be attempted to exhibit in more detail the immediate practical benefits resulting from such an application of the mind. We now turn to, we end that article the following memoir of a much beloved and very valuable member of the Reformed Presbyterian Church was prepared by the Reformed Presbytery of Pittsburgh, of which he was a member and entered on its records as a tribute to his worth. It is the wish of the Presbytery that it appear in the Reformed Presbyterian Journal. Memoir of the Reverend John Cannon just make our start here. Among the tokens by which God expresses his displeasure at the sin of the church, the removal by death of her precious sons is worthy of special notice. Well, that's quite a way to start. Well, we shift now to the Protestant or Princeton Theological Journal. And we have a lengthy, long article by the Princeton reviewers um, in response to a member of the 1836 
General Assembly. And we, or it sounds a little wonky. It also sounds like there's some new school, old school stuff going on. And it's all over this voluntary societies and the missions efforts. Besides, this is a point which has been settled by precedent and uncontested decisions of the assembly almost from the beginning. Almost from the first moment of its organization, the assembly had an existing standing committee of missions, which did not cease to exist when the assembly adjourned. In the year 1828, the assembly resolved that the Board of Missions have the power to establish missions to select, appoint, and commission missionaries, and in general, to manage the missionary operations of the General Assembly, who contested the passage of this resolution. Whoever dreamed before the meeting of the late Assembly, presumably 1836, of declaring it a breach of the Constitution. We cannot here pursue this subject. It is clear, however, as we think, that the Board of Missions and Committee of the Home Missionary Society stand in very different relations to the business of missions, that what in one is a decided infringement on the rights and duties of ecclesiastical courts may have a very different character in the other. It has already been intimated that one great objection to voluntary societies for the purpose of domestic missions and education of candidates for the ministry is the power which they possess. We are aware that the use of this argument is apt to excite suspicion against those who employ it, but the truth ought to be looked at dispassionately and not allowed its proper influence as estimated by reason. We say then that the power possessed by these societies is inordinate and dangerous. It is a power in the first place to control the theological opinions of candidates by the direction of their whole professional education. And in the second place, by means of these candidates thus prepared extensively and materially influence the character and action of the church. It is in the power of the home missionary society to determine what character. We've got a footnote here. The writer with unwanted frankness on page 180, 81 gives us to understand that the one great reason why his friends resisted the organization of a board of foreign missions by the General Assembly was the dread of the power it would give their opponents. The majority acted, he tells us, from the instinct of self-preservation. He moreover clearly intimates that the desire of power was the great motive which advocated actuated the advocates of such a board. So the issue here is authority and power. Their professions of pious and benevolent motives, he very clearly regards as entirely hypocritical. Well, we'll bring that to a close as we turn to the Protestant Reform Theological Journal, in which they're discussing uh, the introduction of the church holidays besides the Sabbath, from the Jean-Rifemir de Kerkin de Nederlands. It's a Dutch article, and pretty much what we would expect from the Dutchmen, as well as some Scots Presbyterians. As an Anglican, we've got a prayer book with all kinds of days on it, created by the church for the good, for the instruction of the church, much like a syllabus that a professor would have not of divine origin, but of good and necessary consequence of education and catechesis. In addition to these weekly observations, the Old Testament, of which Sunday was maintained in the whole church and established as an ecclesiastical day by church and imperial decrees, the ancient church also recognized annual holidays. Among these were Passover and Pentecost, 
also Ascension Day and Christmas, and like today is Pentecost Sunday for us who keep the calendar as a means of education and catechesis. The ancient church believed that maintaining these days was certainly not necessary for salvation, of course not, but for the sake of ecclesiastical order and the well-being of the congregation, the church has the freedom to establish holidays. So the church established the feast of the baptism of Christ. This feast was kept in the Eastern church from the third century and had already appeared in the Western church by 360 AD. January 6th was chosen as the date of that holiday. The holiday of the birth of Christ was already widely celebrated on December 25 from about the middle of the fourth century while in the 6th century, the Feast of the Circumcision of Christ was set on January 1. There's some quibbling between the East and West. An annual feast cycle was organized around the primary feasts. In addition to the Feast of the Trinity, we call it Trinity Sunday. Generally, it would be coming up in five, six, seven Sundays which was celebrated by the entire church in A.D. 1334. There were feasts in honor of Mary, the apostles, and saints. We would note that the Reformation, English Reformation, cut back on all of those unless it had to do with biblical characters, but it has since expanded since then back to an enlarged role. As a rule with commemoration of martyrs and saints, a feast day was set on the day of their death, because that was considered to be the date of their birth in heaven. The feast of a martyr was preferably celebrated at the place of the grave. The feast of all martyrs was celebrated by the Greek church on Sunday after Pentecost, while the Roman church in about the 8th century set November 1 as the feast of all saints and November 2 as the Feast of All Souls, which is still kept in the Anglican Church. We turn to Concordia Theological Seminary. Uh, it's Herman Sass's view of the Office of Ministry up to World War II. And it, the LCMS's president, Matthew C. Harrison, offers his review of Herman Sassa on the pastoral office, which isn't really saying a whole lot, actually. But we read it. Proclamation and sacraments belong together. Where the sacraments are denied or omitted, the proclamation of the gospel is turned into law. A mission that would preach the gospel and omit sacraments would never result in a church but rather a most short-lived society for the cultivation of a Christian worldview. The proclamation of the gospel would die away, says Sauce, like a voice in the wind. If those who come to faith were not baptized, and the baptized did not celebrate the Lord's Supper. Why this is, we do not know. No sociology is able to explain it, because the fellowship of the body of Christ constituted by baptism and the Lord's Supper is beyond the understanding of sociology. We only know that this is the case in the miracle of the church, which is inaccessible to reason, is bound up together with the miracles of baptism and the Lord's Supper. There is only one ministerium ecclesiasticum, the Apology notes that there are grades of the one office, gratis in Ecclesia. There are pastors, superintendents, bishop and archbishops, Sassa says, but they are by human right, not by divine right. Other offices may be established to unburden the pastor. Deacons may be established for the work of love, but they do not take part in church government proper in the sense in the Lutheran confessions. Luther and our confessions understand by church government the exercise of functions peculiar to that office, the authority and command of God to preach the gospel, 
to forgive and retain sins and to retain and dispense of the sacraments. As for other administrative and governing functions of the church, church law is no manifestation of the church of Christ. This is dreary. In the third place, part of his essay, Sass asks the question, whence the office? How does it come about in this world? Luther had a two-sided battle. One was anti-Roman and the other was anti-fanaticism. His fight against Rome was directed against the false notion of a priest. He did this especially in his work to the Christian nobility of the German nation. We'll pick this up later. We, we turn to the Princeton Theological Journal and Nathan Hebe's um, article actually an interesting article on where do we have it here Princeton Theological Journal of Cyro Nestorius and Schleiermacher on the relation between incarnation and the atonement Okay, for a little bit on Nestorius. In sermons and letters, Nestorius, who's a bad name in church history, employs vivid metaphors that forcefully depict the separation and division he sees between Christ's divinity and humanity. In one sermon, he calls Christ's humanity an instrument of God and claims that Christ put on our nature like a garment Elsewhere, Nestorius argues that Christ's body is the temple of the Son's deity. And Nestorius is criticized for creating two Christs. In particularly striking imagery, which emphasizes both the externality of conjunction and the duality of personhood latent in his understanding of Christ, he's actually describing the story as well here. Nestorius describes Christ's divinity as taking up his human nature in much the same work, way that a person will pick up someone else who has fallen to the ground. These two people are now connected to the degree that one is carrying the other, and yet they remain two separate and distinct persons. Nestorius further emphasizes this separation in passing references to Christ's humanity as the assumed man in his statement that God is within the one who was assumed and in his claim that Christ's burial belongs to this man, not to the deity. Cyril of Alexandria. Unlike Nestorius, Zyril affirms the use of Theotokos as a title for Mary because of his insistence on the indivisible union without confusion or change of Christ's divine and human natures. That's very Chalcedonian. Central to Cyril's argument is John 1.14, the word became flesh which he interprets to mean that the Logos appropriated a human body to himself in such an indissoluble union that it has to be considered as his very body. The entrance of the Logos into the human condition is so radical, according to Cyril, that the Logos inseparably and permanently becomes human while remaining divine. So the human nature of Christ is the same as that of every other human nature. The ontological status of the person of Christ is thoroughly unique because he is the only one to possess both a divine and human nature. In contrast to Nestorius, who externalizes the relation of Christ's divinity and humanity to the degree that it is difficult to see how he may avoid affirming the existence of two persons in Christ. 
Syroposites and internal relation between Christ's humanity and divinity, in which they mutually indwell each other in a perichoretic union as two inseparable yet unconfused aspects of the one person of Jesus Christ. And that's the classical view that will obtain through the rest of church history. And we turn to the Reformed Theological Journal. Um, bear with me here for a moment. Uh, this is Christian Platonism and Christological Interpretation, a response to Craig Carter interpreting scripture with a great tradition by Dr. Daniel Trier of Wheaton College up near Chicago. And he's expressed initially at the opening of the article some of his own internal conflicts here. This assessment will take four steps. First, representative aspects of my intellectual journey suggest that evangelical ontology is philosophically underdeveloped prone to particular overreactions. Second, biblical teaching is undetermined regarding a particular theoretical system of ontology so that Christian Platonism is not necessary for faithful interpretation of scripture. Third, however, Christian Platonism, and that's why we're studying the pre-Socratics and Platonic philosophy in another study, Christian Platonism has been providentially inherited by churchly interpreters of scripture so that it cannot be flatly rejected as unbiblical. Indeed, within the sphere of Trinitarian and Christological dogma, this heritage should have some privileged influence. Fourth and finally, an alternative biblical theme has been neglected in recent debates over Christian Platonism, a doxological rather than sacramental ontology. Number one, evangelical ontology philosophically underdeveloped. Like many biblical and theological scholars, I received meager philosophical training, essentially none, until an introductory course in seminary. This training assumed classical definitions of philosophic disciplines, making no clear distinction between metaphysics and ontology, but simply assuming that an ontological claim inevitably involved metaphysical thought. For those of us who are trained in this way, to encounter Heideggerian or postmodern critiques of metaphysics as ontotheology was initially bewildering. It was tempting either to hunker down and insist that the doctrines of God are inevitably metaphysical, or to cave in and insist that the doctrines of God should henceforth become biblical by replacing metaphysics with narrative. Theologically speaking, this dilemma juxtaposed Thomas Aquinas with Jürgen Moltmann, or perhaps Karl Barth would provide a dialectical middle ground, but not for long. By the late 1990s, Colin Gunton and Bruce McCormick were presenting critiques of the classical tradition that in different ways seem more theologically learned and biblically viable than Moltmann's thought. In conversation just after the turn of the century, my former colleague, Henry Blocker, championed John Calvin's supplanting of nature and grace metaphysical scheme with creation, fall, redemption, historical framework from biblical theology. To my knowledge, Blocker has never published this claim in detail. And of course, precursors like Herman Bovink and Cornelius Van Til prompted it. In any case, during early years of teaching, I encountered very seriously Protestant reasons 
for demurring from the full-scale classically Christian ontology. But again, not for long. We'll see where that is going to take us and how that relates to everyday life. And now with um, Southwestern Theological Journal, the use of the Old Testament in the Epistle of James, First and Second Peter and Jude, by Dr. Mark Taylor. He's been outlining the in the book of James, Abram, Rahab, Elijah, Job, showing how James, the brother of Jesus, was shaped in his cognitive environment, to use one phrase. The example of Abraham also picks up on the perfection theme in James in the claim that by works Abraham's faith was made complete and the scripture was fulfilled, which say it says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. Genesis 15, verse 6. James intends to show how Abraham's faith, Genesis 15, reached its intended outcome in the offering of Isaac on the altar, which was the full effect of endurance, James 1, verses 2 to 4. And now for Job. James 5.11 records the only appearance of Job in the New Testament. He is mentioned in association with the prophets, James 5, verse 10, as an example of endurance, which follows a powerful denunciation of the rich who, who, deni- who oppress the righteous. Even though the cries of the oppressed have reached the ears of the Lord of armies, James 5, 4, Justice lies in the future when the Lord returns, James 5, 7, and 8. For this reason, Job is a choice example of faithful endurance in light of the outcome that the Lord brought about. In the biblical account, Job maintained his integrity throughout his ordeal of intense suffering and did not sin or blame God for anything. In the end, God vindicated Job over his three friends. The mention of Job's endurance in the final outcome implies that James' readers knew the full story, that the example of Job plays an important role in the larger context of James, is evident in the careful wording of James 5.11 which reiterates the key themes of the letter, such as the blessed person, endurance, and the final outcome of suffering. The story of Job is as much about God's mercy and compassion to Job in the end as it is about Job's endurance. Now we turn to Thamelius in the discussion on Psalm 2, the Psalter, and the Anointed One the storyline of hope. A number of solutions may account for this strange occurrence. It's possible that the poet is enjoying a play on words with iron in verse 9. Barazel, it avoids dissonance with the following phrase. Aramaic is known to have used been used in Syria, Palestine from at least the 9th century BC. The words addressed to the mouth of the poet to foreign nations and kings, whereas Ben, son in verse 7, is used by God in speaking to the anointed king. It is possible that the poet deliberately uses a foreign word, a loan word, to dramatize the poetic intent at this point. The relationship between Yahweh and the foreign kings is not so intimate. What is implied by the use of the loan word in Psalm 2 is stated explicitly in the rest of the verse. Third, the opening phrase of verse 12 has been labeled the crux interpretum of Psalm 2. McCann has stated that Psalm 2.12 is impossible to understand. 
others in agreement with McCann have proffered interesting but ultimately unsatisfactory alternatives. The exact turning point in translation are debatable to a greater or lesser degree. Nevertheless, the meaning of the entire verse is clear. The close of Psalm 2 demands some sincere submission and homage to be given to Yahweh's king, not just David on earth, but the incarnate son of David now ascended to heaven. Once more, the relationship between Yahweh and the foreign kings is lucid. They are enemies. Yet these earthly kings may enjoy blessedness by bowing to Yahweh's anointed king. God's king, a coming David died. Who is this king? Seems to me that the style and substance of the psalm point to a coming Davidic king. This is evident in the language of the anointed one. Is predominantly applied to Israel's kings, and yet at the same time, this psalm remains in use beyond the extinction of the Davidic line in the exilic period. As observed above, Psalm 2 possesses four strophes, each building on and developing the previous. In the first strophe, verse 1 to 3, astonishment is expressed at the folly of those who've gathered against Yahweh and his anointed. This is emphasized in the lingering question, why would they do that? The astonishment is expressed with confidence because as the second strophe, verses 4 to 6, makes clear, the one against whom they rebel is seated in heaven and has appointed his anointed as king. That is to say, he is omnipotent. In strophe 3, verses 7 to 9, the close link between Yahweh and his anointed king becomes explicit and is evidently based on previous promises made by Yahweh to the Davidic king. Therefore, the psalm closes in strophe 4, verses 10 to 12, with the inevitable option, inevitable soul option, refuge in Yahweh by way of the rebels' submission to the anointed king. We'll pick that glorious article up later. We turn to the Journal of Theological Studies. The editor writes in 1908 in the article Cephas and Christ. He's picking up on Matthew 16 and wandering around. And we're not sure where he's going, but we persist. It may be that the present summary has been added to serve as a foil for Peter's insight. Another the question, who is this Jesus? Who's the Messiah? Some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, some say some of the great prophets, but who do you say I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But the rest presumably shared one or the other popular ideas of Jesus, and perhaps they departed justified rather than Peter. In any case, it is in the manner of Jesus to elicit men's opinions and to expose their self-contradictions. He did not always employ the method of teaching indicated by the formula, it was said to them of old, but I say to you. Rather, he inclined to the use of the Socratic method and therein to reduce men to perplexity in order that they might think out afresh their traditional creed. For Socrates, and we've got a quote here, did not come forward with any counter theories. He declared expressly that he had none to pr propose and that he was ignorant. He put questions to those on the side profess who were professed to know, and he invited answers from them. His mission, as he himself described, was to scrutinize and expose false pretensions to knowledge. Without such scrutiny, he declared, life is not worth living. He impugned the traditional and common creed, not in the name of any competing doctrine, 
but by putting questions on the familiar terms in which it was confidently enunciated and by making its defenders contradict themselves and feel ashamed of their contradictions. So is, are you saying that's what Jesus did here, Mr. Editor? To this description of the teaching of Socrates, it must suffice here to add that he also anticipated death and refused to evade it. One of the answers to Jesus's question, he's John the Baptist. The theory that John was, Jesus was John the Baptist is ascribed definitely to Herod by St. Mark in Mark chapter 6, verse 16. St. Matthew is content to follow Mark. Luke, however, corrects the ascription, which is probably the result of a misunderstanding on the part of some receiver of the tradition. With better knowledge of the original or perhaps of the character of the Herods, he says unambiguously, Herod the Tetrarch was puzzled because it was said by some that John has been raised and he said, John, I beheaded. Is this concerning the one of whom I hear these things? Other popular conjectures are irrelevant here. Perhaps they were added for the sake of completeness by Luke. If they were reported to Herod, he took his stand upon the facts as he knew them and passed over the Jewish fantasy with which he had little sympathy and the possibility of any return from the dead. Whoever believed that Jesus was John the Baptist might be let misled by the mystery which hid his fate, or take refuge in the thought that Jesus had received a portion of his spirit. In any case, the belief indicates a certain narrowness of outlook and neglect of the facts of past history as they are recorded in Scripture. We'll take up the second answer, which is, some say he's Elijah. As we turn now to this exquisite article on guilt in the Hedgehog Review, the strange persistence of guilt, and Dr. Wilfred McClay. In the words of political scientist Tom Berger, we live in an age of apology and recrimination, and he could not be more right. Guilt surrounds us, and its potential sources have only begun to be plumbed as our understanding of the buried past widens and deepens. Gone is the amoral Hobbesian notion that war between nations is merely an expression of the state of nature. The assignment of responsibility for causing war, the designation of war guilt, the assessment of punishments and reparations, the identification and prosecutions of war crimes, the compensation of victims, and so on. All of these are thought to be an essential part of settling war's effects justly and are part and parcel of the moral economy of guilt as it now operates on the national and international levels. The heightened moral awareness we now bring to international affairs is something new in human history, stemming from the growing social and political pluralism of Western democracies and the unprecedented influence of universalized norms of human rights and justice, supported and buttressed by a robust array of international institutions and non-governmental organizations ranging from the International Criminal Court to Amnesty International. In addition, the larger narratives through which the nation organizes and relates its history and through which it constitutes its collective memory are increasingly subject to monitoring and careful scrutiny by a constituent ethnic, linguistic, cultural and other subgroups and are responsive to the nation's past deeds and express contrition for them. 
Never has there been a keener and more widespread sense of particularized grievances at work throughout the world, and never have such grievances been able to count on receiving such a thorough and generally sympathetic hearing from scholars and the general public. The persistence and the growing sense of guilt. We turn to the seed and harvest the publication of Trinity School of Ministry and their outlining January interim courses in 2022, two day courses. The following two day non credit course offerings are available to any member of the Trinity community. Does it say free? January three and four, week one, Hebrew narrative with Dr. Sarah Lebhar Hall. Two, two, two day students will be able to enjoy hearing a memorable big picture overview of the whole biblical narrative. They will then be introduced to some key features of Hebrew narrative literature and will learn what to look for when reading Old Testament stories. Cost $100. January 10 and 11, week two, walking alongside the spiritual direction with Reverend Ken and Joe Ann Martin, helping an individual or group pay attention to the movement of God in the life and their responses at the heart of spiritual devotion. The course is an introduction for pastors and leaders focusing on basic principles facilitating the experience of direction, historical development, and relation to pastoral ministries. Cost $100. Another course, a two-day course, Africa, the Ancient Future of Christianity. Thomas Oden Lectures, series by Dr. Michael Glarup. Ancient, as Thomas Oden argued, Africa has played a key role role in the beginnings of Christian culture from New Testament times. Future, Philip Jenkins asserts the future of world Christianity is African. And as the century proceeds, Christianity will become ever more markedly a religion of Africa and the African diaspora. In these lectures, we will consider Christianity in Africa's past and future through the pioneering legacies of Thomas Oden, Lamin Samna, and Andrew Walls cost $50. We sound very attractive for only a couple of days and only $50. So now to the delightful article from Reform Practice in the May 2022 edition, the context, fundamentalists, modernists, which I call decadent ones, and Fosdick's Sermon of May 21, 1922, the great blowhard Baptist in New York City, First Presbyterian. He hated his doctrinal inheritance. And now we have John Muther <clears throat> of Reformed Seminary in Orlando, Evangelicalism after Fosdick, McCartney as a case study, Henry Emerson Fosdick was clearly picking a fight, as Kevin DeYoung writes when he delivered his sermon, Shall the Fundamentalists Win, on May 21, 1922. At the same time, the fundamentalists themselves welcomed the sermon because it graphically exposed the liberal agenda and would force moderates to take sides. This was certainly true of the first conservative to respond who wrote, one cannot but feel glad that Dr. Fosdick has spoken so frankly as he has. Reverend Dr. Clarence McCartney, 1879 to 1957, was pastor of Arch Street Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia when he wrote a series of two articles, Shall Unbelief Win? that appeared in the Weekly Presbyterian in July 1922, mere two months afterwards. 
McCartney anticipated J. Gresham Bacon's Christianity and Liberalism, published in the next year, as he pressed readers to see that Fosdick was commending a faith completely incompatible with historic Christianity when he wrote, those who above all others ought to read this sermon are not the conservatives and not the rationalists, but the middle of the road people who are fondly hoping that these schools are only divided by a difference in words and names and that the two positions can and will be reconciled. Dr. Fosdick's sermon shows the impossibility and non-desirability of such a reconciliation. Reverend Dr. McCartney went on to defend the doctrinal points that Fosdick challenged, the virgin birth of Christ, the inspiration of scriptures, the return of Christ, and the atonement. He urged his readers to take on the burden to contend earnestly and intelligently and in a Christian spirit, but nevertheless contend for the faith. Specifically, it was the duty of the church to demand fidelity from its pulpits to the church's doctrinal standards. We've got a footnote here. Clarence McCartney shall unbelief win an answer to Dr. Fosdick in William Barker's and Samuel Logan's sermons that shaped America, reform preaching from 1630 to 2001. McCartney's response has often been referred to as a sermon, and McCartney described it as such. The Making of a Minister, the Autobiography of Clarence McCartney, 1961. But I have found no evidence that it was preached at Arch Street Presbyterian or elsewhere. The sheer length of the response argues against its original form as a preached sermon. It is 7,600 words compared to Fosdick's 4,700 words. We'll pick this glorious historic review up again. We turn to Dr. Michael Reeves as we approach our end here. Theologians, you should know, Apostolic Fathers to the 21st century. In the first section, Apostolic Fathers, only let me reach Christ. By the end of the first century AD, Jesus' apostles were all dead, and Jerusalem and its temple had been destroyed. It was a crucial time for the transition of Christianity, made all the more difficult by the hostile notion of the Roman Empire as it began to pay as it saw what it looked like, a subversive new sect growing and expanding. The writings of the Apostolic Fathers are the most important books for understanding the first generation after the Apostles, how they thought, lived, and died. The collection of the Apostolic Fathers consists of about 10 authors who wrote from around the end of the first century to the middle of the second, put together by scholars and termed Apostolic Fathers. However, as a group, they were a mixed bag. Some are works by eminent figures of the time, such as Polycarp of Smyrna. Others are anonymous. They come from different genres, letters, works of apologetics, a sermon, an apocalypse, an account of freedom, instructions on church order. And they represent a wide diversity of theologies Perhaps the best way to understand them is to see them not as the best theology of the time, but as representative bestsellers of the generation after the apostles, as they are not only significant, but instructive. We'll examine each of the works normally included in the collection in order to see what they say and also to see what it tells us about the post-apostolic. Christianity and theology. And we'll be moving on to Papias in our next edition. And now for Journal of Biblical and Theological Studies 2020, an introduction to Catholicity 
with an editorial preface by these Midwest Baptists, I believe. First, the term Catholicity can have broad connotations. This is our last reading can have broad connotations and a variety of meanings for different Christians of different traditions. Part of the purpose of this volume is just to show how different Christians define and use the term. Suffice it to say that Christian Catholicity, at least minimally, shares the conviction that the beliefs and practices are articulated and embodied in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church belong to all Christians. These beliefs and practices, especially as reflected in the early and medieval church, are often called the great tradition. Catholicity seeks to engage with church tradition for the purposes of the spiritual life and theological health of the tradition, church today. While attention to Catholicity or the related Nicene notes has naturally been a part and integral of the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodoxy, Protestants too are recovering in some cases, continuing to emphasize their original awareness and appreciation of Catholicity as developed in the 16th and 17th centuries. How nice of you in 2020 to understand that as if the Reformation Fathers did not. We've been confessing the Holy Catholic Apostolic Church since the Reformation for sure, even though you may not be aware of it. Uh, what's this guy's name? Brian. For many Protestants, and particularly for evangelicals, the Church is one Holy Catholic Apostolic raises no concerns. But to say the church is Catholic invokes worries about capitulating to the Roman Catholic Church. A common way, and there's some evangelicals are get, getting, some of them getting a little freaky. They're discovering, oh, there was a church before the American church and the evangelical church. Oh, there was a church before I was converted to Jesus and the navigators. Oh, why weren't you? And they spoke Latin too. <gasps> Uh, it's a quick story. I remember in seminary, a Baptist guy in the prayer book, it's got in the Psalter, so it's got the Latin title. The rest is all English. So why do you keep the Latin titles? And the bishop said to remind guys like you that there was a church before you were converted. And about said it all. A few chuckles and he, he moved on. Common way of putting it would be to say that for many Protestants to affirm the church as Catholic is a non sequitur since we are Protestants, not Roman Catholics. Furthermore, in the wake of rationalism, sectarianism, and the fundamentalism modernism divide, each especially characterizing the Western world. Protestants have often resorted to caricatures of their own view viewing a high view of the Bible is somehow opposed to the teaching of church tradition. Sola Scriptura in this view is seen as a call against all forms of tradition instead of reaffirmation that the authority of scripture trumps the authority of tradition. This, this guy, he's going to have to up his game. It is reduced to a view summarized as no creed but the Bible very baptistic isn't it implying that the bible is the only authority for a christian this view of sola scriptura a rather recent phenomena is more accurately called solo or nuda scriptura it stands in contrast to the hot historically protestant view thank you a view that went part and parcel of a high view of church tradition Son, read Westminster Confession, chapter 1, paragraph 10. This is going to be painful to work with. We'll listen, you know, the guy's learning some things, I guess. Given the Protestant renewed understanding of Sola Scriptura, there are encouraging signs that evangelicals are pat moving past these misconceptions. You mean your Baptist buddies? Hence the Protestant emphasis on Catholicity. 
footnote one and two. For example, William Perkins, an Anglican, 17th century, by Reformed Catholic. I understand that anyone who holds the same necessary heads of religion with the Roman Church, yet so as he pairs off and rejects all errors in doctrine whereby the said religion is corrupted. 1626. Among many examples of this trend, the manifest written by Michael Allen and Scott Swain, Reformed Catholicity, the promise of retrieval for theology and biblical interpretation. Also Gavin Ortland, theological retrieval for evangelicals, why we need our past to have a future. We'll pick this as we in our next edition bring this to a close if the lord be for us who can be against us glory be to the father to the son and holy ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end amen godspeed